morning, church. Good to be with all of you. Welcome, family and friends here to uh, Littleton Church. If you're first time here, we're honored by your presence, and we love to meet you and get to know you. We're in this series right now called All Joy, and we're we're talking about something that I really like talking about and something that is a growing edge for me. I want to experience more joy in my life. Would you, somebody, if wants to experience more joy, say amen this morning? Amen. 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 Um, We are in a 21-day fast as a church. We are seven days in. If you still want to sign up, you can. If you forgot or if it's your first time here in 2023, you could still sign up and you can grab that full PDF guide. You can catch up if you'd like to. And so we're, as a congregation, we begin the year with, with fasting. We're giving up so that God can pour into us. We're, we're saying, God, you are more important to us than bread. Like, your words give us life. Your presence is what we desire. Like, we, we want to draw near to you. And so we are doing this together because we believe that God can fill us with all the life and power that comes from him, right? That's our vision, is to be filled with all the life and power that comes from God. As people, as human beings, you need God's power. You need the life of Christ, you need it. We must enter into that with him. Like, this is what makes life joyful. Like, so, so we were thinking about what does it look like to be filled with all the life and power that comes from God? Well, Paul writes the Galatian church and says that when you have the Holy Spirit in your life, that he will produce, she will produce love, joy. Love and joy. That when you have the Holy Spirit in your life, that love is produced, that joy is produced, that we get to see the evidence of God working in us. And, and joy is something that Jesus promises to us as being everlasting. Like it's not based on circumstances. It's, it's how we choose to interpret even the hard stuff in life and, and come through it with joy. It's how Jesus could welcome the suffering of the cross and learn obedience through following the Father's word with joy. Like that's what Jesus chooses to do. He, he, he enters into a joy. And that's how Paul writes about things, that he interprets our sufferings as momentary, that they can't compare to the all-surpassing joy that comes with having a relationship with God forever, entering into eternal life. So we believe that people, when we follow Christ, we experience Joy. So this is their theme verse for this year, our vision verse for this year. It's Romans 15, 13. And can you read this with me? And let's, when we get to all caps, let's, let's like, um, you know, let's say it loud. Can we do that? Yeah. But like in a good way, like remember all caps doesn't mean someone's shouting at you. Okay. All right. We're going to just say it loud. Can you do that for me? You say it loud. Okay. All right. All right. Let's read this together. Ready? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. All right? That's, that's our vision verse for this year. All right. We're going to be in Luke's gospel today. Luke chapter 10 verses 1 through 24. And I've been sharing with you words from John's gospel Maybe I should have been in Luke the whole time. I mean, John loves joy, but maybe even Luke likes joy even better. I mean, Luke has a lot of joyful themes in his gospel. Uh, If you don't know this, uh, Luke also wrote the book of Acts, and in there as well are major themes of joy and celebration at the wonders of God. All right, so let's stand together at the reading of God's Word, Luke chapter 10, Verses 1 through 24, kind of a long reading, but that's okay. Listen, we can't get tired of the Word of God. Maybe you'll get tired standing during this reading. Maybe you might get tired standing, but we do not grow tired of the Word of God. Why are we going to read so much? Well, because God's Word has the ability to change our lives. It has the ability to convict us, to identify things in our life we need to give before Him. 
And also, it allows us to increase our capacity to love others. Amen? Are you all with me? Okay. This is Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 24. I need your help reading today. If you could read aloud the words that are in yellow, that would be really great. This is the word of God for the people of God. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. So there's a sense of urgency here. You've got a mission, and you've got a task, you've got a purpose, all right? When you enter a house, Jesus says, first say, peace to this house. And if someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will not return to you. Or excuse me, if not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you. For the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. And I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Sodom is a town that was destroyed by fire and brimstone in the Old Testament readings. He says, woe to you, Jesus says, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you... Listens to me, he instructs his disciples. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy, through the Holy Spirit said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. And all things have been committed to me by my Father. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father. And no one knows who the Father is except the Son. And those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it. To hear what you hear, but did not hear it. This is a reading from God's word in Luke chapter 10. If you believe in the Word of God, say, I believe in the Word of God. So I say, I trust in the name of Jesus. You may be seated. Thank you. Amen. Amen. So as a young pastor, I had a meeting with a deacon, and we were doing a church-wide fast at the time. And I thought that this meeting with this deacon was going to be a meeting where he was going to oppose that we were doing a church-wide fast. And I thought I was going to have to convince this person with the Word of God, with rhetoric, with logic, all the tools that I had available for me to help them to believe that this was a necessity or this was something that was good, a Christian fast. But instead, the deacon just wanted to hear about my experiences of fasting. At the time, we were in a 40-day fast. When I came here, only gave us 21 days, church. Okay, so everybody say thank you. 
We used to do 40 day fast where I came from. And um, he was just mostly interested in, in my personal experience in fasting. And I shared with him that during my fast, it's not like I don't think of food less and think of God more. Sometimes I think about food a whole lot more. Are y'all with me? I think about food like all the time. I even had a dream about food the other day. I had a dream that I went to a counter service and I bought french fries and I brought pizza and I covered them all in ketchup. (laughs) I don't know what that's about. Anybody who can interpret dreams, come tell me. But I think about food all the time. But when I think about food, it allows me to use that as a vehicle to enter into a deeper presence with God. Amen? Like when I think about food, my hunger, it makes me think about my desire for God. That my hunger pains aren't for food, my hunger pains are for God. Like I want to increase my desire to know God and to rely on Him. Like this is how I interpret and believe fasting to be true for for me. And how when I think about God and and act on my thoughts and beliefs in him, it allows me to increase my desire for the work of God and for the people of God, for the love of God and sharing Christ's love with others. And and and, and when I am dedicated in my fast to God, other desires diminish. They can. That's been my experience, that they they diminish. I I have at times when I've been fasting, having desires of greed diminish. Not that they're, they don't ever come back or resurrect at some point, but you know, they do. I've had in my times of fasting, uh, lustful desires diminish, decrease, even seem to be non-existent in my life. And I, I was sharing that with him. And sometimes even my tone though still was like I was trying to lecture to him, you know, I still started, started to get preachy with him. And and he, he, he looked at me and he said, he said, Javon, yeah, I, I get that. In fact, I believe that. He said, you don't have to preach at me. And he said this to me. He said, Javon, I want you to know that people listen to you. And I don't, I don't know if that was like a backhanded compliment at the time, but I always remember that. And it was kind of an aha moment for me as a young pastor. I was like, People, listen. People will listen. And I was surprised by this revelation. And I think the disciples of Jesus were surprised also. That they came back to Jesus and they said, we were heard. We were heard. I believe that people listened to the disciples that Jesus sent on this mission. Jesus sends out 72 disciples in the story on an evangelistic mission. They're sent out and they were to trust in the Lord for his provision. They were to take minimal things with them. And they were to rely on the hospitality of others. I trust in the Lord is what they had to say often to themselves. And maybe, maybe that's been you too. Maybe you've been at some point where you just say, it's not just your last resort, but maybe it's what holds you together. You're like, I have to just trust in the Lord for this. And they had to go out on this mission, trusting in the Lord that he would provide. He promised them that he would provide. And he also promised that there would be some rewards to their efforts. He says, the harvest is plentiful. He said, the harvest is plentiful. And I believe we're still in those times. I think if Jesus came here and he stood on the stage in bodily form with us right now, he would say the harvest is plentiful. He would not say anything different, but I also believe he would still say that there are few workers. And he might even share with us, as I interpret, that maybe the soil is even more resistant than it's ever been. Like it's just hard and it's dry and it, te- it, make, it takes some extra tending for us. The harvest is plentiful is true, but I I also believe the workers are few. This is a great opportunity. I'm not saying this in a way to shame us. I'm saying it in a way that says there is great opportunity. There is much work to be done. 
Jesus shares this with his disciples as they go out with these, this message of repentance and that the kingdom of heaven is coming near and you can be a part of this kingdom. And as they, they went into these towns and set up healing ministries among the people and, and showed them the signs and wonders that God had for them and then, and then helped them interpret what those signs and wonders were really all about. Like Jesus says, people will listen. If they listen to you, then they accept me. But he also said, people will reject you. If they reject the message, they reject me. That they would know, though, who would listen. They would know who would listen because when they would knock on their door or they would greet people, that peace would rest on the home. It wouldn't return back to them that they would share in peace. They would recognize the people who would listen to them about people who gave them hospitality. People said, you could stay at our place. We have an extra bed. We've got a sofa bed. We've got a basement room, you know, whatever, right? We've got a place for you. Sleep in my bed, they would say. We've got food for you. We've got a meal for you. Like someone who would give to them would be someone who would receive what they had to offer. And so they would know. In your life, you will know who someone who is a person of peace by if they offer you something. You ever had a neighbor bring you over some freshly baked bread? Or you ever had a neighbor bring you over some cookies or offer to shovel your driveway? Anybody? You ever had a neighbor offer to take your trash back for you or mow your lawn or you ever had a neighbor to help watch your kids while you were away or sick? You ever had someone who wanted to offer you something? That's someone who is open to receive what you have to share with them. They would be a person that if you offered peace, it would rest on them. That Jesus says in the ministry of a disciple, when they were journeying, that they would experience Jesus, they would experience him, they would experience him by somebody who offered hospitality. So think of someone who has been kind to you. Think of someone who has shared with you. Think of someone who has blessed you. They are someone whom you could bless with the story of Jesus. They are someone who you could bless with the life of Jesus. Of Jesus, the resurrected life, the love of Christ. They'd be someone who'd be willing to receive what you have to share. Y'all following with me, somebody? Are y'all tracking? It's not that you are the only person that gives in any relationship or situation. It's mutual. It's mutual. That might be someone who may be a really good friend, but you just don't know it yet. Why don't you reach out to that person? Whoever listens, receives. And so, when the 72 come back, they were, they came back with just overwhelming joy. They were so happy with themselves. They were so happy. They come back and say with joy, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Jesus said that people who listen will accept them. People who reject them, reject their message, reject them. But they come back and say, even the demons submit to us in your name. And so what I interpret from this is this, this bottom line today is doing the work of Jesus brings you joy. Like whenever you take what Jesus says and you go out and do what Jesus says and do what Jesus does, you might be surprised by joy in the fact that it works. Seriously. I mean, isn't that how hope is? Like we know like what Jesus says and uh, we know what Jesus did. But then when we enter ourselves into the Jesus story and take what he says to heart and do what he says, building our faith on solid foundation, being wise to it, I I guarantee you, even though you've seen what happens in the scriptures, or even though you may have heard somebody else give their testimony about how Jesus used them, you will be surprised. It, It never fails. You'll be like, oh my goodness, they listened. It worked. I saw God. Amen? 
Like, I want us all to be surprised by joy. I want us all to be like, Jesus, I, I, I went to my neighbor, <laughs> and I talked to them. I invited them. I gave an invitation, or I, I, I helped them out with something. We did a project together, and, and oh, my goodness, like, it, it worked. Like, loving my neighbor works. But you'll only know when you put it to the test. You'll only know when you say yes to it. Doing the work of Jesus brings you joy. And so I was like, man, I really want to share that with the church. Like, doing the work of Jesus brings joy. Like, man, the demons submitted to them. Man. But then the more I read this passage and rested in it, there's a plot twist. There's a major plot twist here. Like, what was reported back to Jesus was not that people listened, but what was reported back was that demons listened and submitted. Right? That's amazing. That really is. That's amazing. It's amazing. Y'all probably all seen those exorcist movies, and you're like, I wouldn't do it. You know? But that's pretty dope. Pretty scary. Pretty dope, man. Those, they listen. The love of Christ compels you. You know, and, oh, heads turning and everything crazy. <laughs> right? And you're like, that's amazing. That's the power of God. That's the power of God. Everybody be like, that's the power of God. Nine out of ten church practitioners. That's the power of God. Right? Right? And it really is the work of God. It really is his power over the spiritual world. God is sovereign. God is king. God is champion. And everybody listens to God. And everyone will submit to God's will. The demons believe and shudder, the word of God says. That's a miracle. But that's not the point. That's not the point. Because Jesus replied to their joyous experience. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. And then Jesus says, however, did you catch this when we read it aloud? Do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is what I believe about this. And I'll share it with you by asking this question. What is the point of a miracle? Anyone? I don't normally do this, but what do you think? What's the point of a miracle? Somebody. Demonstrate God's power? Somebody else? What's the point of a miracle? A confirmation. Like this word is true, right? Mm. What else? be the Alexandra reveals God's character character. amen somebody said something points people to God well yes provides hope hope. amen all those things are so true right Susie reveals the love of God God. right miracles signs wonders They do have a purpose. Not only does the person receiving receive a healing or does the person receiving understand that they didn't do it. Somebody else did it. A higher power. Like this must be of God if we interpret it in that way. But I like how John's gospel says he calls miracles signs. That they they direct our hearts. They help us to believe and imagine God differently. But they point us to God's ultimate plan, his son. That the signs and wonders point us to his son. John's gospel calls them signs. Why? Because they point us to the greater miracle. They point us to the greater miracle. God in the flesh. Jesus who takes away the sins of the world. Our Savior who grants all who believe eternal life. So we rejoice. Not that demons submit. But we rejoice that we are participating in a greater miracle together, guiding people to eternal life, the resurrected life of Jesus. And Jesus says it this way in John's gospel, in John 14, 12. He says, very truly I tell you, 
Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. Right? This is Luke 10. You will do the works I've been, I've been doing these things. That I'm sending you out to do what I've been doing. And the demons will submit to you. And you will be spared from harm like I have been. But, but you will go out and you'll do what I'm doing. This is the call of each follower of Jesus. You go out and do what Jesus does. And he says, they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Jesus gives the work to us and says, the greater work, the greater miracle is that people's names get to be written in the books of heaven. That's the greater miracle. Don't get caught up in the miracles of casting out demons. Don't get caught up in the miracles that they submit to you. Don't get caught up in those miracles. Don't get caught up in, I can give you an abundant feast just out of a couple of loaves of bread and a couple of fishes. Like, I could give you much more than that. I can give you an eternal relationship with the Father. Jesus redirects our focus, church. He says, it's all about the people. I came and suffered, Jesus says, on the cross. Not so that demons would submit. Yes, Jesus and the cross is the answer to evil. It is. But that people, we, you, your families, your, your friends, your neighbors, your, everyone, that people, people would have no barrier, no barrier at all to coming into relationship with the Father. The sin would be forgiven and removed. Shame would be removed as an obstacle. They, they would you would have a clear conscience to, to stand before God as a son or daughter because of what Jesus, Jesus says. That's the greater miracle. That's the whole point. Joy is found in that. Amen. I want us to stand together. Stand together. I want to invite the worship team to come. There is joy in doing the work of the Lord. May you be surprised by joy. It's all joy in Jesus. May you be surprised by joy. And I want you to know that uh, those people were blessed. When I say those people, the disciples, those there got to witness it. They were blessed because they got to see. And you are so blessed abundantly because you believe. You just got to read it. You believe in the invisible God. But the God that is everywhere and is in everything. The God who is in everywhere and in everything and chooses, though, to have his manifest presence, his intimate presence in your heart, in your body, in your mind, in your story. God enters into your story. The God who created all things enters into your story. And you are blessed because you believe and you have yet to see his fullness. Amen? You are blessed. You are blessed. So go in that blessing and joy. And go be a good neighbor. Go be somebody like those that are surprised by joy by putting the work of God into practice. I want to pray over us. If you have any prayers or anything, you can send them in to the text here. You can text them in to 720-358-8858. Uh, those of us online, you can enter them into the chat. We'd love to hear from our online worshipers. Just enter them in the chat. We'd love to hear your prayers. So let me pray over you and be blessed. Holy Father, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the joy that you bring. Father, we pray, Lord, that we will enter into the promise that says that there is a harvest that's plentiful. And if we choose to do the work, Lord, we will reap a reward. We will see people respond. May they not reject and may they come into a relationship with you because we thank you that Jesus Christ, that you have given us a path that's unhindered and that is free. May we be free of all of our sin. May we confess your name. May we believe in you. We come to know you even more. It's in Christ Jesus that we pray. And all together we say, amen.